There's a lot of stuff that you've been thinking about for years, and now we get to deliver the Clone War. OK, this better deliver. One of the lures of going back and finishing the prequels was that, in fact, I would get to do the Clone War. What I'm really hoping to feel from the audience is that it takes them back to their love of Star Wars. I want to see them sink back into their chairs and just gasp, because they will see something that I, I think they've never seen before. I want it to be as cool as I'd imagined it. I want to blow people away with it, actually. The kind of movies that I make, which are very action-oriented, uh, very complex visually, I really couldn't do it without some kind of pre-visualization process. The cost of making a movie and the cost of marketing a movie are so intense that we have to look for ways that makes us much more cost efficient, that allows us to be able to express ourselves in this huge world. Pre-visualization has definitely been an increasing trend, whereas six or seven years ago, you would mainly have storyboards. In the old days, we would use those, but they don't tell you the movement. They don't help you with the cutting. The cutting is achieved by figuring out motion across a scene and when is the right time to cut. And you have a vehicle passing by and cut to a close-up of a character's reaction. We have always had to use some kind of device to give you the sense of motion. For the end battle of New Hope, I used bits and pieces from documentary films about World War II and war footage of airplanes flying and that sort of thing. Here they come. On uh, Empire Strikes Back, we had to do little cartoons of the walkers walking and the explosions and stuff. Return of the Jedi, we built little models and we took a video camera and we shot little videos of these little models on sticks going through the frame. And when we finally got to Phantom Menace, we were able to actually use digital animation to do our videomatics in a more sophisticated way. Eventually, we came to rely on that department to uh, really define how the movie would go together. And the best way to do that is to be able to create the semblance of film. As if you've gone out and shot with thousands of people, you can't do that on a storyboard, but you can do that when you pre-visualize a sequence within a computer. When George first writes the script, he has in his mind what the movie's gonna look like. When he goes to shoot it, it's remarkable to watch him shoot because he shoots like no other director I've ever seen. He's going and getting elements. He's not getting a finished scene. When Obi-Wan was walking around in Camino, George showed him concept paintings of, okay, now you're walking down the hallway and you're looking and you're seeing the cloning facilities, but there was nothing for him to see. So it's a very raw and it's very rough, but what he's getting there, he's getting the Obi-Wan element. The pre-visualization guys are filling in what that hallway may look like. Imagine two shots, Obi-Wan's talking and then Lama Su's listening. Master Sifo Dyas was killed almost 10 years ago. How long do you want Lama Su to listen? What do you want Lama Su to do? So the animatics team will put in a rough Lama Su, and then George can cut that in the avid and can start making decisions on how long do these shots need to be. You pick up pieces of shots rather than shots as a whole and then you construct the shot later. You're able to collect bits and pieces that go into the images separately, sometimes a year apart, and just stick them in. It's a very different way of approaching the medium. It's virtual filmmaking, and it just is an enormous tool for everybody who actually wants to be able to explore and see it in real time. It's a way of making movies where you don't do one process and then go on to the next process. It's like you do a little of this, a little of that. It's more like cooking, and it's more like painting. You know, you paint, you move it around, you kind of thing, you paint a little bit more. He can shoot blue screen with nothing in there except for the actor. The Animax group can then fill in a huge city. In film, it very much had developed along an assembly line fashion where you did this piece and then that piece went to that piece. For me, I don't work that way. I'd much rather kind of go around and put things together, look at them, and then move them around again and look at them until I get them the way I like them. That can be very expensive. So since I have to finance my own films, I had to develop a system where I could have that kind of creative freedom and it wouldn't really destroy me financially.
We take our animatics and we build them piece by piece until it creates a sequence that would be almost the same as if we were shooting it real. And that's a huge change in the movie process because it allows the artist to have much more control over the images and the type of images. You don't have to go out and sit on a mountain for three months waiting for the light to get just right. You can actually create it and make it be just right the way you want it in your mind's eye. We knew we had a speeder chase, and we knew basically what the action and the dialogue was. The speeder chase started with a one-page summary that George had typed up, so I had the basic gist of who was there and what was going on. Storyboards were coming, drawings from the art department. In order to start the process, we would take images that had an object moving across the screen right to left, up, down, going away from us, and that would show you the motion of what was happening. And then we would intercut that with the pilots and the people and all that sort of thing. We didn't have the pilots and the people yet. So Ben and the assistant editors would go out into a barn with a little blue screen and they would shoot various characters, you know, flying around in the cars. Ben shot a lot of material of, uh, I think of uh, one of his daughters as uh, Zam and a couple of uh, the editorial assistants as Obi-Wan and Anakin. We used the, the old land speeder down in the archives. And we have a couple of lights. It's really Ben, myself, and a couple of other people. We used George's uh, Ferrari for the speeder. and I think we put a few scratches on the roof. And we created this chase sequence. If you'd spend as much time working on your saber skills as you do on your wit, young Padawan, you'd rival Master Yoda as a swordsman. I thought I already did. A sequence like the speeder chase, you really can't do it without animatics. It's all motion, it's all action. You really need to develop videomatics to kind of tell you editorially where you're going and how long the shots are going to be and whether it's working, because it's a purely kinetic thing. It's things coming at you, it's you falling down through things. It all has to do with movement. Then he cuts it together, he shows it to George, George makes his changes, God, he said, God, I'd love to have a high shot here, or it'd be great to be low here, we should see the instruments now. And as those discussions progress over a number of days, we shoot it. You know, we'll have lunch, we'll go out and shoot for three or four hours, come back, dump it into the oven, and then we just start to cut. And then George takes it and bends it and molds it. And it gives you something to then sit down with the videomatic guys and tell them kind of what you have in mind. And you say, well, this is right, but this is going too fast, or move it up, move it down. And then they would turn that into a rough example of what we were thinking about. Once Ben was done with his videomatics, we were able to bring that into the digital realm and actually built the science fiction versions of all these things, the actual speeder, Zam speeder, digital proxies of our hero characters. And then we'd take that and we'd blow it up, move it around, cut it out, change it around, and then give it back to the animatic department. They would then make a finer representation of that until we got the shots the way we wanted them. We take that film, we bring it on the set, then we have a speeder on a gimbal on blue screen and we're able to put huge plasma screens in front of the speeder so the actors can actually watch this bizarre cartoon in front of them. They can understand and interact with what's going on in this surreal blue screen world that they live in. Which I think helped a lot because otherwise you'd be directing a scene like that by yelling through a bullhorn. You'd say, okay, now this is gonna happen. Turn left and right. Okay, you're coming up on Sebulba. Sebulba's ahead of you there. You see him, he's maneuvering, he's flaming. Somebody, he's exploded somebody in front of you and bang, pieces flying past your head. It's a very cumbersome, a uh, way to get the actor to understand what's happening is to yell at them over a bullhorn. It's easier just to show them the film and they react to it as if they were in it. In an odd way, that videomatic sequence became playback like you'd play back a pre-recorded song and people might sing or dance to it as a guide. That, if we had not shot with the animatics and pre-visualized the sequence, probably would have taken three or four days to shoot, but we cracked it in a day and that is so helpful in terms of the schedule that we have. After I'd say the first cut, the first real rough cut, George felt there was a little bit that needed uh, to take place in Reel 5. The kinetic energy of the movie had picked up to the point where we were starting to get some momentum. And to stop and have dialogue at that point uh, just didn't work. And the Droid Factory uh, had lots of potential for an exciting sequence. There's a great scene where Obi-Wan is looking down into the basically the deep bowels of this droid factory, the churning wheels and, and uh, droids being made. So we see Obi-Wan's POV, and that piece of art had been approved by George and had been hanging on the wall for a while. It tripped off a whole thing of expanding that and really like, let's go on 
you know, a fun adventure inside the Droid Factory. The Droid Factory sequence came up, uh, you know, eight or nine months into the editing of the film. It was never originally part of the story, so it didn't get the pre-visualization treatment that we might have given it. So one day we get this call from George, hey, come on downstairs, I've got an idea for a new sequence. First, what I did is I did some storyboards with a storyboard artist, and I put them out, and I told them the ideas of what I wanted to happen. In the Droid Factory in particular, it was really a point of pinning down an environment in the storyboard process. Where would actor be? How does George want to frame the, the, the character? Is it a close up or a wide shot of the space? And he's very specific when he's talking to us. He'll say, "Let's. I want a close up of Pat May here. I want a shot that includes this robot arm threatening Anakin. These storyboards were a shooting schedule basically for George to frame the actors properly on these blue screen sets that they were building. Then I went to London to set up the reshoots. I mean, this was the fantastic thing about it. We had a blue screen stage and a blue conveyor belt, and that was it. They shot the characters running around on the blue screen, interacting, reacting to threats that were not there. We shot the whole sequence in four and a half hours with both Natalie and Hayden. We did it before lunch. And then came back and cut that and gave it to the animatic guys. When we are getting footage from those actors, really they're in a conceptual void. There's just a bunch of blue screen. We chose 10 or 20 key frames from the sequence to kind of flesh out in an illustrative sense. So then we would take whatever was existing in the shot, a door, Anakin and Padme standing by that door with a retracting drawbridge, and plot the perspective down from there, establish kind of a grid in 2D space, kind of go into it as a painting. Eric and I decided that this should be a smoky, very uh, threatening environment. Uh, the Reds, uh, the Magentas, the, kind of a hell-like Dante's Inferno um, in Star Wars land. I'm very keen on um, using color as a main element in telling the story. Each environment and each emotional complexity has its own color system. Sometimes it relates to characters, sometimes it relates to environments, and sometimes it relates to you know, good guys, bad guys. And so Eric and Ryan were sort of the color police to say this is the color we want this sequence, this is the color we want that sequence. And a lot of the color is rather melodramatic and strong. We talked a lot about the philosophy of the colors of the different areas and I think they were very anxious to get a sense of progression. Eric actually established a color scripting of the entire sequence, plotting out the dramatic highs and lows and this is where this big welder arm comes in and uh, sparks are flying so we knew that when we approached that production illustration. Mood-wise and coloration-wise, it would be flashier than some of the somber scenes where we need to really concentrate on kind of the wheels turning in the actor's heads. So by refining that design process, that is something more literal that the animatics team can start doing a rough 3D model building. And then we gave it to the guys upstairs, the animatic guys, and um, they just ran with it. Creating the Droid Factory sequence was quite a challenge. We really never tackled a sequence that involved 100% 3D props, environments, and stand-in characters. We really relied on Eric and Ryan's paintings for look and feel. Their paintings had incredible mood and story, and it really brought you into the feeling of the, of the piece. The actual details of it were, a lot of it were left up, up to us. We had some sketches of machines, but we didn't have a whole lot of uh, detail stuff. So I took um, our team of painters and modelers and some of our key lighting people, and we went to a uh, big car factory out in the South Bay. Those are very, very impressive spaces. They're you know, huge interior spaces, sparks flying everywhere. That was the sort of feel I really wanted for the factory, really dirty and smelly, so you could almost smell it. Because these sequences were envisioned and put together well after principal photography was actually done, we had a lot less time to actually do them. And they all went just absolutely nuts. I think they were working 20, 22 hours a day, sleeping upstairs, and they came out with this remarkable scene. The fact that the schedule was so short and it was such an effects-heavy schedule meant that the animatics had to be brought to a new level. The animatic process and the term of making the movie got to be very sophisticated. And one of the best examples is the Droid Factory because when we got the videomatics for that, they were really great looking. And because it's a very intense action sequence with giant machines and things, when you see it in blue screen, it's pretty boring and silly. You don't know what's going on. But once you get those giant stamping machines and stuff cut in there, it's very powerful. And so in that particular case, the videomatic department made a huge difference in our ability to visualize and, and follow the drama of the whole sequence. 
by building these 3D models and timing out the sequences with the actors, they're able to merge the blue screen elements, block in shapes of the droid factory equipment. They will even introduce background elements and that will be all sandwiched together, rendered out. When we get into the animation, I will take the animatic, I will take my notes from shooting in Sydney, and then I sit down with George and say, okay, we're about to go into the sequence. This is my understanding of how the scene plays. And then he'll say, well, you've actually got a lot of freedom in here. The animatic is rough, or the animatic is very much what I want. You need to follow that very, very precisely. The video matic department has become so sophisticated that uh, you're getting almost completed shots. It was extremely gratifying to be behind George while he was requesting changes and revisions. And to have him actually look at the screen and question whether or not it was a final shot from ILM or an animatic. You know, ILM will go in and clean them up and, and finish them off and add the detail and make them show up so they work on a giant screen. After ILM would do completed shots, Eric and Ryan then would come in and kind of bring them together fix guys here or there, basically paint on top of their frames to kind of help them provide art direction. We're doing a lot of the paintings digitally and it's really about creating a synthesis of painting to the camera arts to you know modern filmmaking. We were very excited about being able to attack it from beginning to end and follow it through. That's why this was kind of kind of unique. Eric and Ryan, they're not just concept supervisors. They create a look, but what they have in addition to that is extraordinary ability to take a sketch, a painting, and show us the process of how we make it real. The Clone War, basically, we bypassed storyboards altogether and went straight into animatics. It was a huge sequence. In the movie, it has literally thousands of characters, droids, clones, troops, ships. Basically, we got a page that said, and all hell breaks loose. An incredibly complex, dense scene to do. The Clone War shots are really big, epic shots with lots and lots going on. And, and it, it wants to look like a big, momentous battle because it's been talked about for so long. The references to it in the episode four. You fought in the Clone Wars? Yes. I was once a Jedi Knight, the same as your father. So it's, it's been you know, part of the Star Wars lore for years, and fans have been wondering, you know, what's that going to look like? The animatic for the end battle was really a sum of about two years' effort. Everybody had a very firm idea of what they could do, what we could get away with in the amount of time we had. They were much more confident in their ability to do exciting shots, and everybody came together as a unit on that project. By the time we got to the end of the film, which is where the the uh, end Clone War and that sort of thing, they got very fast in their ability to develop very, very complicated shots in a very short amount of time. We didn't really know what George's reaction was going to be because we were pulling in a lot of new kind of camera moves and a lot of new shot angles that hadn't really been typically associated with the end battle sequences of, you know, say episodes four, five, and six. When I said, look, I just want some great battle shots. So I let them sort of have their own way with some of those shots, just come up with some great shots and I'd use them. So that really inspired him. We put in a lot of extra zooms, we put in a lot of extra camera shake, like you have to get to this situation or you, you have to catch the action that's going to be happening. It was the final battle of the sequence, it was a very exciting thing to do, it was what everybody had been waiting for. And at that point, everybody just kind of exploded creatively. They put a lot of time and effort and creativity into it and came up with some amazingly complicated and interesting shots. They were churning out 30, 40 shots a day. And you know, after a week, you got 200 shots. And it's amazing how much you can play with that. We took those, started cutting them in, made some modifications. Some of them we couldn't use, some of them we could. And then we started to build other shots around those shots and to build it into a full and complete sequence. When we saw the animatic of the Clone War, I had goosebumps. I had rarely get that from an animatic. And animatics are usually so rough. But the animatics team at the ranch had done such a fantastic job with the Clone War. It had handheld cameras. It had ships flying in. It had missiles spinning around. It had these big, huge walkers. It had everything that we, as teenagers of the 70s and early 80s, saw in those original movies. And that's what you do it for. We're going through a kind of evolutionary process when I talk about digital technology, um, most directors have no clue how to be able to use it. You know, they're just learning. Using all this new technology for me is a complete learning process. You know, what George does, then Jim Cameron will do, and that'll turn everybody in, make it even bigger, and then Spielberg will do it, and Zemeckis, and Ron Howard, and all the directors who love this technology. George challenges us 
every time he comes up with one of these ideas. I push people a little bit farther than I think they can actually go. And then they always surprise me by getting there. He's always trying to take things a little bit further and, and that in turn makes us want to kick it up a notch and it's kind of a brutal cycle actually because we are constantly trying to outdo ourselves and George gets used to that and so we've got to up it a notch every few months. And then I say, well, gee, this is great. If they can get there, then I'm going to push them a little bit further and see if they can get there. I sort of feel like you're part of some weird science experiment. It's like, okay, okay, let's see what they can do without. Okay, let's take away their food. They're still alive. Okay, great. Let's take away their water. Still going. Okay, let's turn down the oxygen level. So they keep saying, okay, you guys have to do more with less. Sometimes they don't make it, but almost always they do. You know, we did it, so I guess they were right. <laughs> I'm constrained by my own perception of what they can accomplish. And I've learned, especially in the digital world, that I can actually push them a lot further than I think. And it opens up my creative process, because I go, well, what if we have him do this? And what if, you know, and in the real world, you wouldn't even think of something like that, because it'd be way too hard. But in the digital world, you say, well, okay, we'll do that. We'll try that, see what happens. That was the challenge for us, to be able to work closely enough and be capable of delivering everything that we possibly could for him to express himself. Very rarely do I not get what I want. You know, there are a few times when we all sit down and give up and say, you know, this is too far, too fast. Uh, but they know that eventually I'll come back to it on the next film and we'll try again. Eric and I consider ourselves very lucky for being able to work on a Star Wars film. When I was a kid looking at Joe Johnston's sketchbooks, the Ralph McQuarrie paintings, portfolios, that's what inspired me, that's what motivated me to want to get to where I am today. You get to draw on the rich canon of the Star Wars legacy. You have a demanding and vocal group of fans that you have to satisfy. But the big thing is you have yourself as a fan and as you were when you were a kid looking at these films and thinking of you going to those now, you have to satisfy that person as well. I spent two years on this movie and you have good days and you have bad days and you have long days and you have hard days. And, but at the end of it, we're making entertainment. We're making a movie and we're making a Star Wars movie. That's when you think, okay, it's all worth it. Who need that? No, no, no. Oh, no.